So, without me going on and on, I want to give it over to Martha Cassinet. Thank you. Okay, so I'm just going to give a very short little presentation here on pinhole photography. Chris Patton is, is a person that I teach pinhole workshops with, who is, uh, we call it a dog and pony show. I'm the dog, he's the pony because he's a scientific person and he gets into all the optics and the scientific things that nobody understands and I just do the art. Okay, so what is a pinhole camera? It is any, any kind of light tight container that's got a little tiny hole. It's the oldest optical system that we have. Believe it or not, this is a pinhole camera. You can make your mouth into a light tight box and you can go and make a picture. Okay, characteristics of pinhole are that there is both no focus, because there's no lens, and infinite focus, because the aperture is so small that you don't have to worry about what's in focus. It's not sharp, it's dreamlike. You have uh, long time exposures, because the aperture is so small, so you can get ghosty images. And generally, not necessarily, but generally you want wide-angle distortion. Now these are all the characteristics that you want to use to make an image pinholey. You know, I'm always telling my students, why are you using a pinhole camera instead of a regular lens camera? What can the pinhole do for you that lens can't? Now here's an example of different focal length. The focal length is the only thing that's the variable here. A six inch box with a four by five back is more or less a normal focal length. So it would be equivalent to maybe your 50 millimeter on a 35 millimeter camera, okay? Not so interesting. But as soon as you get a little wide angle, a three inch focal length on a four by five, you start getting some distortion and the object looks farther away. One inch. Look how far away the radiometer is. It's the same distance as this one from the pinhole itself. But you get this terrific distortion and it moves far away. So if you're going to do pinhole photography with a short focal length, get really close. There's, you can make a pinhole camera out of anything. It's our students make them out of Coke cans. You can put three pinholes in a little Tabasco can, chocolate can, and make three images. Okay, um, this is a homemade 6x9 foam core camera that you can put roll fill in. A 35mm Leica camera changed into a pinhole camera, and this is a 120 that you can purchase that you can put roll fill in. So that's handy because you can send it out to be developed. Here's some examples of pinhole effects the moving water, the light flaring. If you have your pinhole pointed towards the sun, the light just flares out into these wonderful flares. You can't predict it. Um, and if you're working with color, the light breaks down into the colors of the rainbow, the prism color, so it's very, very cool. This is the camera that did the black and white coastal pictures with them. <coughs> by this camera, you can see how corroded it got from being hit by waves. There's another advantage of pinhole photography is that the cameras aren't very expensive, and so they're, you know, pretty durable, and you can put them right on the ground and get hit by waves and whatever. This is a homemade, really nice. Now, this is me working, doing these pictures. I don't use a tripod for any of those. I put the camera just wherever, as I say to myself, wherever a crab can go, that's where the camera can go. So we just don't use tripods. Tripods are far too conventional for pinhole. No self-respecting pinhole camera <laughs> wants to be on top of a tripod. <laughs> so this is an example of some of these, the moving water. So these objects here are really tiny. They're only about that big. This is the kind of distortion you get with a short focal length. It's just wonderful. How far is the model from you? Not very far, maybe as far as you are. Not very far. How long was that, was that exposure you remember? About 15 seconds. Okay. Cloudy day. I only go out pretty much on cloudy days. I got the idea that I wanted to do underwater, at least partially underwater. So instead of <clears throat> investing time and energy into getting somebody to make me an underwater housing, I decided to just buy a $15 aquarium and just try it. This is my little prototype and see if it worked. We had Polaroid 4x5 back then, so that was a big help. Turns out it works. So then Ryuji, he built this for me. I designed this, this underwater housing with all the features that I needed. And the features I needed were pedals, 
that I put my feet on in the tight pool to hold it steady. A window, of course, to photograph through. The housing here goes up and down on these poles so I can get different water levels. This is my shutter that I can just pull up and down while I'm sitting in the tight pool. A, a sunny day underwater was okay. In fact, it was better. That's what the underwater ones look like. Uh, and then there's a few of these pictures that I put in here that I'm hand coloring with oil pastels. Uh, then at our workshops, we demonstrate what we call the bug cam that has all of these holes in it. It's less than a one inch focal length. This is what a bug cam picture looks like. <laughs> the next picture shows you just one of these. Okay, so here's a very crudely made pinhole with, which was punched with a straight pin simply through aluminum foil. And so it gave me a much uh, fuzzier image than a precisionly drilled, laser drilled pinhole. And these are some of the couple of the pictures I did in a series using that pinhole. So they're much less sharp, but I wanted them to look really dreamy and ambiguous. Now this is, these were made with a uh, pinhole on a 35 millimeter, which also doesn't come out very sharp because the picture area is very small. By the way, this is why digital pinhole doesn't work really great because the sensor is so small. Your image area is so small that you lose a lot of detail. But in this case, it worked. Hyperfocal box cameras are not quite pinhole, but they approach pinhole because they have a very small aperture and you can't adjust it. And you know, everybody has a hyperfocal camera now. This is one of Chris's pictures with his, one of his hyperfocal cameras. He also doesn't use a tripod. He put it right up against the wall and he just held it up against the wall. So um, when not to use a pinhole camera? Doing ordinary landscapes, doing ordinary portraits, any viewpoint, four feet off the ground, tripod heights. Now, I don't want to be categorical about that, okay, because I am using a tripod on some of those now. Don't tell anybody. Why would you use a pinhole camera to do an ordinary landscape or an ordinary portrait? Pinholes are extraordinary, super ordinary, surreally ordinary. Why use a pinhole camera? To express dreams, memories, fantasies, or narratives not concrete specific reality to show unusual viewpoints to make use of wide angle distortions to show the passage of time you can make ghosts misty water clouds movement to play with near and far elements and to make candid images like in chinatown where nobody knows you're photographing no viewfinder no batteries nothing i love it what kind of film do you use four by five Try X, oh. ISO 400. How do you determine exposure? Yeah, um, there's a number of ways. You know, my students tell me there's an app for that now. <laughs> <laughs> what I use is I have a spot meter that goes to F128, and because this is two stops smaller than F128, I take a reading at F128 and extrapolate from there and then double it for reciprocity failure. That's how I do my exposures. Could you say it one more time? Okay. I have a spot meter. The smallest uh, F stop marking on that is F128. It doesn't go any smaller than that because it's not made for pinhole, right? So my, this pinhole is two stops smaller than F128. So I take a reading for F128, extrapolate two stops more exposure from that, and then double that for reciprocity failure. <coughs> it works. I'd like you to talk a little bit about these two series, some of your motivation and your concepts and your feelings. Well, this is the earlier one. It's really one of the only times I've ever gone outdoors to do photographs because I'm pretty much of an indoor-ish person. I've never been interested in landscape, you know, but my friend Chris made me go out because I was in a hiatus. I wasn't doing any work at all. He said, just take your pinhole camera and let's go out. I said, I don't want to go out. I'm not outdoor, but he made me. And then I discovered props and things. Well, then, then I realized that in his office he had hanging a whole 19th century outfit he had 19th century clothing, 19th century camera gear, telescopes, everything. And I said, it's all over for you. He had to be a model in my pictures because I'm basically still not interested in landscape. I like the narrative quality of having a mysterious figure in there. 
so it was all kind of 19th century. And, and then I remembered the first poem I learned in my Russian classes when I was a teenager, and it was a poem by Lermontov, and we were made to memorize it, and it talks about seeing a sailboat far off, and it's a metaphor for a lonely person. It says, what is he looking for? What is he running away from? You know, so then this figure kind of became someone who was looking for something, but maybe also avoiding something. And so, and then this series, I got started going around all the touristy places in my area. And I thought that hand coloring would be good for that because it's not quite as serious in a way as, as this work. What do you use in, as far as uh, medium for color, coloring? Um, oil pastel sticks. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome.